There is a girl in a white dress with huge black wings, and there are four of them flying into the sky, including our protagonist. Kurizuka Yuma, a freshman in college, is just passing the time in his life and has no goals in life. Everyone around him has a so-called life, but Kurizuka doesn't give a damn and is satisfied with his life. He's walking outside after class when he thinks about going to a bookstore. There's a feather floating on his head when suddenly a hole appears on his feet. He sees a girl who looks so terrified and is begging for his help to save the world. He falls into the hole and is woken up by the sound of a man. There are four of them that have fallen from that hole. He introduces Burke von Gardgel as the king of the Gardgel Empire. The first thing Kurizuka thinks about is getting isekai The king doesn't say more and wants to get straight to the point that they are the chosen ones to be heroes. Kurizuka's chest is beating loudly after he hears King Burke von Gardgel say that the king asks them to help their empire's quest to subjugate the demon lord and his army. Kurizuka's face looks scared and terrified, and he wants to go home. Kurizuka hates everything that's scary. Then suddenly, one of them, who also got summoned, asks what he should do and what he would earn by helping the empire. Kurizuka is surprised at how casually he talks to the king. The king's courtier answered that they promised to give them fair treatment and rewards. The empire will also teach them all the lost arts used by heroes to earn God's blessing. The guy who also spoke about rewards said that he'd go home if the blessings that God would bestow on them are useless. Kurizuka is amazed at how that guy speaks highly like they are just normal human beings. He also wants to initiate a conversation, but when he sees the king, guards, and everyone around him, he gets scared that he can't even speak. Everyone is gathering at the altar because they will start their rituals. Then, the Grand Prix shows up and introduces herself. They get mesmerized by her beauty. Her name is Edna Hans, and she will help them gain God's blessing. The Grand Priest wants to begin the ritual, and she wants them to go upstairs one by one. The guy who talks casually said that he wants to go first. The Grand Priest says to go enter the magic circle, and suddenly, the magic circle lights up and produces a fire that surrounds the guy. The Grand Priest congratulates him because the god of flames that judges sins bestowed the flames of hell. Then, the next one got the Shenron memories bestowed the power of ice. Kurizuka is praying to acquire a blessing that can protect him from getting hurt. He gets called by the Grand Priest. He gets terrified, and while walking into the magic circle, he feels like his heart will pop out of his mouth. Everyone then notices a feather that is falling. The Grand Priest stops for a moment, and Kurizuka is looking at her nervously when she says that the God of Healing bestowed Kurizuka the ability to revive. He gets at ease, and at the same time disappointed, when he hears the Grand Priest say that because he can heal himself, he still has to take hits. The courtier approaches them and says that their blessings are phenomenal, and he thanks the gods for their blessings. He also prays for the hero's safety and health. He offers them a luxurious meal. As they are going out, the Grand Priest looks at Kurizuka fiercely, while Kurizuka is still thinking about having the magic of healing. What if he still has to fight? He hates pain and is too anxious about it. They are in the kitchen and get treated by lots of food. The courtier says to enjoy the food and feel free to have their share. Kurizuka's face sparkles with joy when he sees the food and says that he will try his best in the world. Everyone is eating at the table, when the guy who also talks casually asks Kurizuka if his name is Yuma. He confirms it, and the guy says that Kurizuka's blessing isn't even useful in battle. That guy's name is Akanishi Keita, a second year high schooler and got blessed with Hellfire. A guy interrupts Akanishi and says that they got plenty of front rows and it should be balanced. His name is Araki Takuya, a first year college student who has a blessing of ice. The girl is thankful that they have a healer and said that she needs help when this time comes. The girl's name is Araki Kodami. He's glad that he doesn't need to fight, but he also feels bad. He still has a role in the back line, so he says to himself that he'll practice healing magic tomorrow as much as he can. The courtier of the Grand Priest are having a conversation. The Grand Priest says to be careful because he is precious. The next day, the courtier wakes up Kurizuka and says that they want him to be there because they are fighting the Demon Lord and have a lot of injured soldiers and their supplies are limited. Since Kurizuka has the power to revive, he asks for his assistance. He gets deployed, and the courtier gives him a coat. He thinks it's the same as the hospital coats. They come to a room, and he asks again what he should do. The courtier smiles and says that they will use his flesh and blood. They drag Kurizuka to the chair. He asks the courtier what he meant by that. He's now scared of what is happening. The courtier tells him to calm down because he has the blessing of immortality. Whatever they'll do, he won't die. Kurizuka asks if he could start by just taking his blood and not rushing things. However, the courtier suddenly slashes his hands. He shouts out of fear, and he gets slapped by the courtier, telling him that he won't die. His hands regenerate as if nothing happened. Everyone is shocked at what they saw, and the courtier picks up his dismembered hand, saying how amazing it is. The courtier then wants to proceed to drugs. The courtier asks his subordinate if he saw it, and his subordinate replies that it was incredible. There is a book and a feather. The girl sitting on a chair drinking wine is smiling while saying that he is still alive. A girl with a peculiar eye is seen with a feather on her hands, while she is talking about using a feather of all things and wondering what is happening out there. Kurizuka's eyes are closed and he sees his past. 
When he was in the college university room talking with a friend about Yamada, saying he would marry his girlfriend after he graduated from university, the scene suddenly changes, and now he is sitting with his mother at the table and eating. His mother is talking about Kirizoka coming up on his second year in university, and telling him to start thinking about his future. He's looking at his hand holding a bowl with soup tofu, and Kirizuka says whatever happens, happens. And for him, that's good enough. Then, everything snaps, and he sees his hand getting dismembered. The courtier says that everything was marvelous, and Kirizuka should be proud to serve the people in this way, forever while beheading Kirizuka. Kirizuka wakes up, catching his breath, traumatized and coughing. He is exhausted and holding his neck. He looks at his arm and says that it was just a dream. He just sits there and realizes that he fainted during the experiments again. But as soon as he wakes up, the experiment begins again. He curled up onto his bed while mumbling no more. He sees the courtier's face smiling, and he says that he's tired of it day in and day out. He doesn't even know how many days it's been. He is gripping his hands when he hears footsteps. He gets scared, and says that the people who always torture him are there. He thinks it is a patrol, but then he recognizes the shoes of the courtier, and he loses hope. He sobs and asks for help, when suddenly there is a magic circle above him. The people who are guarding him outside are talking when they notice a small light coming from Kurizuka's cell. The courier hears a sound coming from Kirizuka's room and asks his subordinates what that sound was. They rush to his cell and are shocked because Kirizuka suddenly disappeared. Kirizuka opens his eyes and sees a big, unfamiliar tree. He sits down and asks where the hell he is. The room is big with pillars, and in the middle, there is a big tree and petals are dropping. Akanishi and Araki are playing chess freely in the room. Araki checks Akanishi, and Akanishi is pissed because he lost again. It's his fifth loss in a row, and Araki teases him. Araki is happily surprised to think this world would also have chess of all things. Akanashi wants a rematch. His body is covered with fire because he is mad. Araki says that Akanishi also hates losing. Katomi approaches them and says if they are still playing even though they just went back home from a dungeon quest. They are still energetic and it is getting late. They should go down and go to the cafeteria for dinner. Araki arranges the chessboard and says that they will just pick the chessboard after they eat. Akanishi is still pissed, but he agrees. He wants to eat some meat if they will go have dinner. Katomi laughed and said sure. Katomi opens the door and notices the courtier in the hallway. She approaches them and asks if something is wrong. The courtier says that there's nothing wrong. They are rushing because they are going to have a conference and add to not mind them. Katomi compliments them for working so late and should take care of themselves. The courtier just smiles back at Katomi. The courtier tells his subordinate that the summoned person should not know everything that happens. The courtier's subordinate said yes, and added that the only place they haven't searched yet is the labyrinth. The courtier gets troubled by Kirizuka. The courtier will request for aid and assistance from the priests. The courtier wants them to go first to the lower central levels of the labyrinth and search for the subject. They go their separate ways. Kirizuka is still laying under the big tree, because he has no energy to move. He then again asks why, Kirizuka hears a footstep from afar, and he quickly gets up. One of the courtier's subordinates initiates a conversation about rumors on the labyrinth, but he thinks he would go that far. Their leader then says it is because the area is restricted to the priest class and above. The guy adds that further up from there, then the leader shouts and watching his tongue angrily. He quickly apologizes, and the other guy notices something on the wall. The leader says it is a trap against the intruders, and with the artifact that he's holding, it will keep them safe. However, those people who don't have an artifact are waiting for nothing but death. Kirizuka is walking in the trap zone, and blades are cutting his body, but he still quickly regenerates. He says that being like that is nothing like a monster. He is in the middle crying and asking why everything is happening to him. He shouts out that he'll get out of there. The guards see him, and he runs away. One of them tries to catch up with Kirizuka. Suddenly, there's a big hand, and he gets crushed by it. The leader says it can't be helped, and it is instant death magic placed by Yamagi against the monster, and not even the artifact will help. The leader says that they should wait for the priest to arrive, and the other one wonders why Kirizuka wasn't struck by the instant death. Kirizuka is far from them and says the place is strange. He sits down because he's exhausted, when he suddenly hears a sound below. He gets scared and peeks at the wall. He sees a girl below, and the girl introduces herself as Ava. She asks Kirizuka what's his name, and that is their first encounter. Kirizuka is stunned because there is a girl underneath the hole, and he introduces himself. Kirizuka sees the pipes that are attached to the girl, and he quickly asks if she is also being subjected to human experimentation. The girl is confused about what Kirizuka said, and she just says it was something like this. Eva then realizes that Kirizuka used two in his question, and says that it means he is also being forced to undergo experimentation. Kirizuka said yes with a frown on his face, and Eva said how unfortunate Kirizuka's situation is. She offers him to relax down there for a bit because people don't often go down there. Ava notices something. She is confused. She tells Kirizuka that he looks like he got there all by himself and asks him how he managed to get there. Kirizuka tells her about how she asks and tells her she could say it by force. Ava is confused about what Kirizuka said by force, and Kirizuka adds that if only he didn't have the blessing of immortality, he would have died multiple times by now. 
Ava is surprised by what Kurizoka said and also says that he doesn't look any different from a regular human, and added that maybe that's why he got experimented on. He looks at Ava again and sees that she is still pretty healthy. If by chance they also had a similar situation, he calls Ava Miss, and Ava responds that she is fine. He then again calls her, but this time Ava and Kirizuka are stuttering and saying the word if she would like to, but he can't contain it and shouts if she would run away with him. He adds that even though his fighting skills are non-existent, if he uses his blessing of immortality, maybe it will be enough, and he could do something about all the traps. He just couldn't abandon her, so he is forcing Ava to run away with him by saying they should fill their lungs with fresh air and eat delicious foods until their stomachs are full. Ava is just sitting there, and her eyes widen. She gets stunned by what Kirizuka said. Kirizuka is now embarrassed and stoned because he hasn't gotten any response from Ava. Even though Kirizuka hasn't stepped foot outside the Empire since he got summoned to that world, he confidently says everything to Ava, unconsciously, just to help her get out of their situation. Ava calls Kirizuka's name, and he is shocked. He responds and repeats what he said earlier. Kirizuka says he would use his blessing of immortality if he went first. Ava shouts his name, and he is frightened. Ava says there is no need to grow accustomed to pain or fear, because if he wants to remain human. Kirizuka is shocked by what Ava said. Ava then asks Kirizuka if he could see the pipes all connected to her. He responds that he could see everything clearly. She explains to Kirizuka that those pipes are there to drain her blood constantly, 24-7, and adds that's why she's always anemic. She doesn't have the energy to move, so it is troublesome. That's why he could share a little of his blood with her, and that way she could help him escape. She also says that she may look like that, but she's actually pretty strong. Kirizuka then says to himself that those guys are also doing the same kind of thing to her. Kirizuka stretches his arm and says if she needs blood, she can take as much as she wants because he will never die. Ava also stretches her arm, saying it was a promise while smiling. There's suddenly a black thing coming out of Ava's arm. It flew above Kirizuka. Ava tells him that that little thing is a part of her. It lands on the arm of Kirizuka and bites him. It flies back to Ava and disappears into her hand. She then wonders if she can get rid of that magic circle on her nape. She easily erases the magic circle and she thinks that she had already used up all the blood she received. She flies outside her cage and is now on top of Kirizuka. She swears to Kirizuka to set him free. She bit Kirizuka's neck and Kirizuka is blushing while realizing that Ava was a vampire. Ava is happy because it's been a long time since she fed directly and it's been so long since her body is so light. She thanks Kirizuka and kisses him. She carries Kirizuka and laughs because she picks up something interesting. They fly and Kirizuka is screaming. They go to the middle where the Magi are the first to hurdle. They pass the room without getting a response from the Magi. The guards saw them and confronted Ava, breaking through using Kirizuka's immortal blood. The leader of the guard commands his subordinates to fire at Ava. She blocks their magic, and the leader is frightened because even mid-magic level won't slow them down. Ava fires the magic, and it creates a crater. She flies to that hole. Ava wants to turn the Empire into a sea of fire. They are on the outside of the kingdom while Araki, Akanishi, and Kotomi see them. They panic while saying she is also holding Kirizuka. Akanishi tries to attack Ava and says to her to let go of him. She dodges easily and goes behind his back. She is ready to fire her magic at Akanishi, when suddenly Kirizuka shouts at her to stop. It is almost too late. Ava controls her hands, and Akanishi almost gets hit and is stunned by the huge amount of power Ava releases. Ava complains about why Kirizuka stops her from killing Akanishi, and Kirizuka explains to her that they are also summoned like him. Ava says what stun is done, and that much should slow them down. Ava asks Kirizuka what he should do now, and he says that he'd find a way to go back to his old world. Ava says she would be his bodyguard, and Kirizuka says it is both reassuring and a little unnerving. Promises are important to vampires. They fly away to the kingdom while the Grand Priest is looking at them. A mysterious guy is kneeling before the courtier. He demands the mysterious guy to recapture and return the immortal subject from that vampire. He tells them he's free to use that tool. Yuma woke up in an unknown place where Ava had brought him. He found her naked while taking a bath in the rivers. For Yuma to see a naked woman the moment he woke up was too much for him. She even invited him to take a bath as well. On the other hand, he was wondering how Ava was able to walk out in the day when vampires were supposed to be weak against sunlight. Shortly, a boy suddenly appeared and approached Yuma as he was giving him spare clothes. Ava then introduced the boy to Yuma after seeing his face full of confusion. He thought that the boy was their acquaintance, but he was just some traveling salesman that Ava used her skill on to turn him into a slave. Mind control is a vampire's forte, which explains how she made the boy into a slave without exerting too much effort. Yuma was worried, so Ava assured him not to worry because she wouldn't dream of making him her slave, for she was his bodyguard. After that, both of them were already dressed, and since there was a big town nearby, they decided to go there. Before going to the big town nearby, she fed Yuma a delicious meal. He cried out of joy because of how delicious the food was. Meanwhile, Ava was just looking at him while he was eating. She explained that she had already had half her fill while Yuma was sleeping when he asked her why she was not eating. Soon after he finished eating, they began their journey to the town. While they were on their way, both of them encountered a man with money, and Ava used mind control on him to get the money. Yuma was not pleased with the mind control method, and he didn't want to rely on it, as he supposed there were other ways to quickly earn money. 
At that instant, Ava realized that she had done was not good. She then told Yuma that they could quickly earn plenty of coins if they hunted monsters and sold them to the guild. However, in order to sell them, he first needed to register as an adventurer. After a while, in the middle of their journey, Yuma observed that their surroundings were a bit quiet and empty, which Ava agreed to. She disappeared for a second, and when she came back, there were already monsters in front of Yuma. She did something to make the animals and monsters appear, then proceeded to kill them all effortlessly. It turned out that the reason it was so quiet was because they were trying to flee, running away from her. Ava mentioned something about the item box because Yuma asked how they would be able to carry all the dead monsters and sell their parts. He was clueless about the box, so she explained to him that all the summoned ones could use one if they would called it. She also told him that they should have an appraisal skill. If the monsters were classified immediately, it would make things easier later on. Yuma, with a shocked face, was not told about it, which meant that it was his first time hearing that. Although Ava had already heard about the legendary item box, she was still in awe when she saw it in real life. Yuma was able to control various things, but he was unaware of it. He sensed something, a monster that was still alive. A hollow circle suddenly appeared in front of him, and when it disappeared, the monster died. He had no idea what just happened, but he assumed that it was magic. After that, the sun was just about to set, so they decided to go to the place of Ava's friend, located nearby to stay there for the night. The exterior of the place looked like a haunted house, but it was actually popular. Yuma, with a terrified face, thought the place was only popular with the undead because of the ghosts roaming around. Ava's friend, the owner, greeted her as they went inside the house. It has been a long time since they last saw each other. She complimented him, saying that he was looking as bright as ever. Ava asked him if they still had an available room. He proceeded to guide them to their room. A frightened look was plastered on Yuma's face as they were on their way to their room because the place was filled with scary monsters. Despite the scary looking house on the outside, the interior of the room actually looked gorgeous. It was way different than what Yuma expected, but that was perfectly fine with him. However, there was only one bed, so he offered that he and Ava could sleep together and share the bed. She declined because she would be sleeping in the coffin. He was embarrassed because he thought that she misunderstood his offer, but for vampires it was expected that they would be in a coffin. When Yuma lay down in bed, there was something under his blanket. It was a little ghost. The next morning, Ava woke up and found a ghost on top of Yuma's back. The ghost was really fond of him. It kept clinging onto him, and he didn't get a wink of sleep. The ghost was following him everywhere. He tried to shoo it away with his hands, but it was intangible. It looked like it was going to follow him outside of the house as well. If Yuma's got a ghost on his shoulder, there was no way he could register as an adventurer. The owner saw the ghost following Yuma around, so he gave him a spirit tome. It was used to house spirits, but it should work for ghosts as well. If he kept the ghost inside the stone, he should be able to walk around freely. It would serve as a guardian spirit. Momentarily, Yuma proceeded to register as an adventurer. The ghost wasn't drawing any attention. However, he was totally being stared at by everyone at that moment. The appraisal was complete, and he was given the adventurer card. The card was needed in order to buy or sell monster parts, and could also be used in place of personal ID. He was excited to earn money with it. Ava also got excited and wanted to see the card, but a man approached her. He told her to ditch the weakling, referring to Yuma, and invited her to a party. Yuma was contemplating what to do, knowing that she was being hit on by the man, but she had already declined the offer. Ava was the devoted type and wanted to go to the dungeons to find monsters rather than go to a party. Before going to the dungeons, Yuma wanted to see Ava's stats using his appraisal skill first. Monsters started to appear and attack them, which she found awesome because it was the first time that she was attacked by the monsters. Based on Ava's stats, there was a toggle for monster aggro, so Yuma tried to turn it off. She was surprised that summon people could do something like that. Ava decided to take a look around, and Yuma would be collecting all the drops. He reminded her to make sure not to get found out, which meant she was not allowed to use her wings. As he was collecting the parts of the dead monsters, the ghost came out of the blue and helped Yuma. Up until the present, everything still seemed like a dream to Yuma. He still hasn't fully understood what was happening, but the thought of him not being alone anymore calmed him down. Yuma was suddenly held captive, and when Ava returned, he was not there anymore. A giant creature attacked her, and she fought back with rage as she asked where Yumi was. Ogul was then sent to attack her next, but there was something off about it. There were markings on its arms. She realized that it was the undead with holy magic. On top of those high-level restraints, there was a search team from the church. To see pure blood in such a state was expected of the central church. Yuma witnessed how Ava's face twisted, and he sensed something wrong with her. To see a beautiful face twist in such a way, the enemy found it stimulating. The binds that were all around him disappeared as he was trying to escape from them. He used all of his strength to make a portal appear in front of him and reach Ava. The portal led him to her, and the restraints were dispelled as they were together again. He immediately went to her and asked her if she was alright. Although his attacks did nothing, he was able to do defense magic. Yuma's power was unstable, so he couldn't use it at the moment. However, as he thought about Ava's magic, he came up with an idea. Ava asked Yuma about the idea that he came up with. She then realized something about his magic. 
Yuma had a little knowledge about his magic, but he could do an instant teleport and could use a barrier thing as well. He was panting as he explained to Ava about his magic. She told him to relax and just take it easy. The ghoul's acquaintance, an old looking man, was shocked when he saw Yuma together with Ava. He was wondering how he got there so quickly. He instructed the ghoul and the giant beast to tear them apart. They came prepared to prevent Ava from escaping. They even used a magical barrier impervious to physical attacks. The ghoul used more high level holy magic to attack them. Yuma was getting the hang of it and thought he could make full use of another teleport thing to counter attack. However, he still hadn't gotten used to his teleporting magic, so he needed more time to concentrate. Ava found him interesting. The magic that Yuma was using was ancient magic. Unlike current era magic, which had to be understood in order to be used, ancient magic relies on intuition and emotion. Judging by the lack of symbols in his magic seals, there was no mistake. He needed to visualize his will. The ghoul and the giant beast tried to strike again, but Yuma was able to use his teleportation magic to avoid their attacks because of his strong will not to get hurt. The ghoul was not affected, which made Ava wonder and realize something. An undead who used holy magic and was resistant to it committed a taboo. When Ava realized the truth, the old looking man admitted that he was also shocked when the church handed the ghoul to him. Meanwhile, Yuma, the immortal kid, had zero knowledge about this world's magic. Magic was originally a power held only by magical beings. The magic used by humans was simply borrowed from spirits or divine beasts and nothing more. Therefore, even if the same level of magic was used, human magic was nothing compared to that of truly magical beings. Thus, the church did that kind of thing a monster loyal to humans, a weapon to use holy magic against its fellow monsters. In order to be a ghoul, children from birth were sacrificed. He explained how the church was able to create such an incredible ghoul. Yuma called him out for sounding so proud when he said that he sacrificed children. However, in his defense, those children were orphans, and they just made use of the worthless lives that were thrown away. The man may look like a human, but in reality, he was actually a monster because of the things he had done. Alchemy, which distorted reason, was taboo. Ava knew that the church would steal magic to create a chimera, which she thought was going a little too far. The man then manipulated her into thinking that her mindset was simply archaic. Yuma called Ava to have a word with her. Shortly after talking, they went back to business. Their fight resumed, and they attacked each other again. Ava used her mind control skill, while Yuma used force blocking on the ghoul. Her skill would only last a moment, so they needed to hurry with their plan. Their plan was successful. They were able to take down the ghoul, but also save the kid. They did that in order to take the child back. As a payment for manipulating and using the child to be a ghoul, Yuma used his teleportation magic to take the enemies down. Afterwards, they proceeded to walk back home to the house where they were staying. It was their first day at the dungeons, but a lot of things had already happened. It was a long day for them, though they got some unexpected loot. Ava was surprised when Yuma said that he wanted to take the ghoul, but it sounded interesting, so she got on board with the idea. She asked him what he wanted to do with the kid that she was carrying on her back. She got no response from Yuma, so she called out his name. When she turned around, she found him already knocked down on the ground as they were walking. Yuma woke up in an unfamiliar bed. He was greeted with a good morning by Ava. His memory was a little foggy, and he asked her if they were staying at the same inn they went to before as he scanned the room. The master of the house prepared something for Yuma to help him make himself feel better. He didn't know what it was, but it smelled so good. Right after the thing in the dungeon, he was so tired that he outright fainted, even though he was immortal. Physical fatigue was easily remedied with magic, but as for mental fatigue, a massage would be the best. Ava was excited to give Yuma a massage, but he did not feel the same way. As she tried to reach for him to give him a massage, he panicked and said that if anything, a massage from Ava would make his mental fatigue worse. She calmed him down and decided to head into town for a little shopping instead, since he didn't want a massage from her. When Yuma heard that, he was worried that it might still be dangerous, and that something like what happened when they were at the dungeon would happen again and attack Ava. However, the master of the house assured him that the town was incredibly strict regarding altercations inside their walls, so as long as they were within the town, there would be no issues because they got a strong guild to keep the people safe. With that being said, Ava instructed the little ghost to look after Yuma while she was out. She then left and headed to town. He suddenly remembered about the kid and the ghoul that they brought back with them on the spur of the moment. Yuma, lost in his own thoughts, spaced out, so the master asked him what was wrong. Something was troubling him as he thought about being a target. As long as Ava and the kid were with him, they would be in danger. From that moment forward, he was going to be chased by the church. That was why he was really grateful to have Ava with him in order to protect him. However, he was worried that Ava might get caught again by the church because of him. The master assured him that she had far more than an incredibly cheery disposition they could imagine, so he needed not worry about anything. On the other hand, while Ava was roaming around the town, the vendors called out to her, willing to give her a discount as they were trying to sell some fresh fruits. The salesmen were so impressed by her beauty that they were all willing to give her a discount if she bought from them. After she bought things from the market, she heard the news about a pack of wolves in the forest. A random guy reported that there were at least a few hundred of them. The head of the guild was instructed to assemble all the adventurers in the guild at once. According to the witness, one incredibly large direwolf was leading the pack. All direwolves were huge, so the head of the guild was confused about what he was talking about. He then ordered the adventurers to fall in line. 
As soon as Ava heard about the details, she went into the forest. When the man saw her going to the forest, he tried to stop her because it was dangerous, but she just thanked him for his concern. The men were trying to calm down, as they were not prepared enough to head in at that moment yet. They eventually had to go in soon, which was why they needed to gear up already. In the forest, there was a man and a woman being targeted by the wolves. The man used a sword as a defense, but it was instantly crushed as the wolves struck. They lost the sword, so they decided to run instead because they were left with no other choice. Ava's arrival was immediately recognized by the wolves because of her scent. The direwolf that was leading the pack sensed that a bat had the guts to come and get in their way. After 400 years in the forest, the direwolf had become its master, so from then on, he should destroy the human settlements to further increase its power. The wolf stopped Ava from interfering, but knowing her, she would probably take down all of the wolves at once. Ava thought that a young one such as the Alpha itself shouldn't be so rash, since a mere few hundred years was nothing compared to her being long fond of the town away up ahead, and her companion was currently taking a rest in the town. As she said that, she turned into a wolf. The other wolves realized that she was a thousand-year-old pureblood, and there was no way they could defeat her, so they had no choice but to back out. After a short time, Ava went back to the center of the town from the forest as if nothing had happened. She even commented that it was quite lively around the town. The head of the guild told her that he was worried about her since the forest was dangerous, but little did he know that Ava had already handled the matter. She said that the wolves were just passing by, so they didn't have to worry about it. On the flip side, at the inn, Yuma was wondering how the kid would turn out while stroking his head as he was sleeping peacefully. Yuma wondered if the kid without a master would stay asleep forever, and during that time, if he didn't eat, he might continue to decompose. The housemaster called Yuma's name and told him that emotions were such that sometimes, before someone knew it, they could become overbearing, and so, sometimes, being selfish was equally important. He then excused himself and took his leave. He told Yuma to call him if he needed anything. Yuma was left in deep thought when a feather fell down. The master noticed the white feather flower, which was most suitable for relieving fatigue and depression. If the master remembered correctly, in floriography it means, I pray for your happiness. During what was supposed to be a merely simple scouting mission, a man with a skeleton body along with other monsters wreaked havoc. Three adventurers were left in charge to handle the creatures. The leader among the three was frazzled at how they couldn't seem to defeat the creatures, given that these were the undead. It was almost as if their enemies were so powerful, possibly given a thick miasma from their authority. Attack after attack, all of their efforts were worthless, as the creatures just kept coming back, as though they were immortal. As they were already cornered somewhere in the woods, they were surprised by the sudden appearance of another creature. It appeared to be the leader of the undead army who attacked them. It also had a skeleton for a body and wore a pitch black cloak instead of the worn out clothes worn by the other creatures. A bunch of crows suddenly flew high into the sky, indicating the death of the adventurers. One of the crows flew to the haunted house and delivered a message to Davis, the caretaker of the haunted house who also knew Ava. He knew it was from an informant who had valuable information about the situation faced by the deceased adventurers. Meanwhile, Ava went into the room and asked Yuma to take a look at what she was holding. In her arms was the body of the former ghoul, now with a broken arm. Yuma, being scared of scary things, jumped in shock. He was stressing about what they should do about the broken arm. He knew that regeneration wouldn't work on the body that was unlike his, who had been blessed with immortality. Ava stated that even magic couldn't regenerate the broken limb of the body due to its dead cells. While they couldn't think of an immediate solution, they tried to cover the body with bandages. They were interrupted by a sudden knock on the door. It was Davis. He asked if he could interrupt their moment. Ava told him to come again later because they were busy dealing with the body. Eventually, the two left the body upstairs for a moment. They headed downstairs to the dining area to enjoy David's splendid tea. To start the conversation over tea, Ava asked Davis to talk about what he wanted to say earlier. Davis shared the news he received from the Crow. It was about a group of undead who were rampaging in the eastern mountains. The center of such a group was said to be an incredibly powerful lich, a king of the undead. Ava was intrigued with the news she heard from Davis and began to ask questions about the lich. Davis described the intensity of the lich's power based on the surrounding miasma in the forest. It was said to be a highly powerful king of the undead. He also added that the lich was accompanied by quite the army of the undead. With that, Ava was sure that they would be able to overwrite the Lich. Curious as to what Ava would overwrite, Yuma asked her and she told him they would overwrite the Ghoul's control authority. She began to state the fact that the Ghoul had no master. To make sure that Ava would be the master of the Ghoul, they would have to overwrite the high-grade authority control magic. Yuma finally understood what she meant, but was curious if it wouldn't make the Lich the Ghoul's master instead. Ava reassured him that she would have the Lich cooperate with them. If not, the Lich would be terminated by Ava, who was also a powerful being. As they got outside, ready to leave for the mission, Davis handed Yuma a letter. It was addressed to their informant and it contained an introduction from Davis, as he was the recipient of the information he shared earlier. He also told Yuma to watch out for the venomous insects of the mountains. Before Yuma could get completely frightened at the thought of the venomous insects, Ava told him that they would fly to their destination. As usual, Ava carried Yuma and the friendly ghost went along with them. 
After a while of flying, Yuma finally spotted the eastern mountains. Before they could successfully land, the ghost who accompanied Yuma suddenly left his side. He wasn't sure where the ghost went off to. It spotted the informant they had to visit to give Davis's letter. They landed, and Yuma asked if the being in front of them was really the informant. This was because he was taken aback by the appearance of the informant. It had long hair, pale skin, and pitch black eyes. Something unusual and scary for the likes of Yuma. Yuma was terrified at the sight of the informant and fell to the ground due to shock. Ava approached the informant and recognized that it was a banshee. The banshee accepted the letter and told him that it was confirmed. It also said it would report the information it held as an informant. It even mentioned the group of the undead in the forest and how everything that lives was rotten and vice versa. The banshee said that there was no point in sending any adventurers because some have died in their missions. It was determined to have been dangerous to the point that even the other undead beings were found harmed in the situation. The Banshee mentioned that with thicker miasma comes greater power for the undead. There was also extreme pain for the lower grade undead. The Banshee begged them to save the suffering bunch of the undead. Ava politely declined, stating that they were not the focus of their mission. She said that they were only there for the powerful Lich. However, she reassured that they would definitely make an impact on the miasma present in the forest. The Banshee spared her last piece of information to them. It advised them to walk and not fly, as they would not be able to see through the miasma from up above. As they ventured further into the forest, Yuma found it difficult to breathe. It was hard for some humans like him to breathe around such powerful miasma surrounding the area. Ava was quick to notice and thought of a solution that would make traveling easier for Yuma. She suddenly transformed into a normal-sized wolf. Yuma was shocked at Ava's transformation. She told him to get on, as it would be much easier not only for him, but for the both of them to travel together. As Yuma got on Ava, he felt her soft wolf fur. Together with his friendly ghost, Yuma and Ava continued on their journey to meet the mighty king of the undead. As Ava turned into a wolf, Yuma rode on her back so he wouldn't feel too weak due to the heavy miasma surrounding the forest. They were finally able to travel to the woods a bit easier. Suddenly, Ava stopped because she couldn't figure out where to go to lead them to the source. Her target was the powerful lich wandering around the forest. However, she struggled as she was confused by the powerful miasma surrounding the environment. Yuma wondered if the little ghost could show them the rest of the way, because a ghost should be drawn to the lich's presence. The little ghost led the way and they passed by many undead creatures, which made Yuma ask Ava if the little ghost wouldn't go wild like those undead. He was worried that the little ghost would submit itself to the powers of the mighty lich that controlled the army of the undead. Ava assured him that the little ghost wouldn't be affected by the miasma, because it was closer to a sprite more than anything. With that, they continued to venture into the forest. After a while of traveling, Ava saw the Lich which was a sign that they had finally reached their destination. Ava interrupted them by asking if she could talk to the Lich. She had finally seen the powerful being with only a skeleton for a body, covered by a pitch black cloak. Taking a glance at her, the Lich figured out Ava was a high rank vampire just by her presence. Her aura radiated a strong radiance that could be recognized by someone like the Lich. To her dismay, the Lich then told her that he did not have the time to deal with her. That provoked Ava, because she traveled into the Eastern Mountains in the first place with the goal of defeating the powerful Lich who had caused so much chaos. This caused her to release a little force, targeting the undead army of the Lich that killed the three adventurers after daring to attack them first. The attack was so severe, it killed the Lich's current army and caused a major explosion. After the explosion that killed the Lich's army, it noticed how Ava was the insatiable pureblood vampire. Hearing that made Ava furious. She hated the description the Lich used to describe how potent she was. The Lich told her it had seen her before and it was an honor to be visited by Ava. Even though the Lich wanted to talk now, it had no interest in exchanging words with those who have chosen the path of monsters themselves. It sounded like it was discriminating against Ava, which was ironic due to the fact that the Lich itself produced monsters. This was indirectly targeting Ava, who was seen as a monster by the likes of the Lich who bore such high miasma over the undead. Ava couldn't even hold her frustration anymore. She wasn't too pleased with how the Lich was talking to her. She felt as though she was seen as a mere vampire, and not something more, something that could defeat the Lich. Feeling determined, she raised her pets, the Bloody Servants. The Bloody Servants attacked the remaining undead army under the control authority of Ava. She released firepower because according to her, even bones turned to ash with enough firepower. She was determined more than ever to terminate the Lich's army. The firepower along with the Bloody Servants who were under Ava's control caused the death of all the remaining undead creatures controlled by the Lich. It created a massive explosion that could be seen from afar. In need of more company, with no one by its side anymore, the Lich summoned an undead dragon, which was formed out of black magic. The dragon was gigantic with wings much larger than Ava's. It also looked like it barely had any skin, as it seemed like it was mostly formed out of a dragon skeleton. Yuma was worried and thought that that was definitely not good. He was extremely frightened at the sight of the dragon, as if the previous army wasn't enough. Almost like a reflex, he immediately gave Ava a barrier before the dragon roared and released its power. Yuma did not want to always rely on people. He did not want to feel inferior under those who protected him thus far, especially Ava. If there was something he could do, he would do it. 
he knew he only needed to control his free will to manipulate the powers into an attack that would benefit him and Ava. While the undead dragon was attacking Ava, Yuma attacked the Lich. He threw shots of his powers onto the Lich as much as he could. As expected, the Lich did not even flinch from the attack, almost as if he was immune to Yuma's powers. Analyzing the attacks, the Lich immediately recognized Yuma's ancient magic. The Lich decided to take care of Yuma first, but Ava appeared right in front of Yuma to protect him. Then suddenly, a creature awakened, which got noticed by the Lich. While it was distracted, Ava attacked the Lich. Even while the Lich was mostly busy with the newly awakened creature, the undead dragon released its fire breath towards Ava. Not even dodging the attack, Ava made fun of the dragon by saying that its attack was not strong enough. Ava was about to attack again, but the undead dragon carried the Lich and flew away. It angered Ava, as she still wanted to defeat the Lich and its undead dragon. So, she flew up and followed them without even carrying Yuma with her. Yuma called Ava and told her to wait, but Ava did not hear him because she flew as fast as she could to try and catch up with the Lich. Since Yuma couldn't fly, he followed Ava by running inside the forest. Following Yuma, the little ghost tried to get his attention by pulling his clothes. Yuma thought that the little ghost might be showing the way, so he followed it, but the little ghost brought him in front of a hole. Before he could go into the hole, Yuma wondered what was inside of it. He was tempted to look down the hole, but he was scared. All of a sudden, Yuma wondered why it got so chilly all of a sudden. He was even starting to get goosebumps. Yuma noticed that the little ghost was looking at something, so he looked back to see what it was. And what he saw made him tremble in fear. Yuma and the little ghost were taken back at the sight of a giant baby zombie. It had a crooked smile, scales on its back, ears that were as sharp as an elf's, and four horns on its head. Its head also had a crack along the center, and it had pitch black eyes with a bright white pupil. Ava suddenly flew into where Yuma and the little ghost were. She was looking for a bag of bones. Yuma called Ava and she landed to ask what was up with Yuma, given that he was as pale as a ghost. He said that he was that pale because he was left behind with the little ghost, as Ava went off to follow the Lich. After taking a look at the giant baby zombie, Ava figured that it was the main reason as to why the Lich was in the forest in the first place. Yuma, confused as to what the Lich might want to do with the creature, asked why. Ava began to explain how easily the baby zombie could take over a large population, given the amount of effect it had on the undead within the area alone. As he was listening to her, Yuma was shocked. He didn't realize how a giant baby zombie alone could immensely impact a lot of innocent citizens. Right after they had that short conversation, the Lich suddenly came back to where they were. It even said that they were a nuisance. Curious as to what the Lich's true intentions were, Yuma asked what the Lich hoped he would gain by creating the zombie baby. The Lich was quick to correct Yuma. It clarified that he was not the creator of the extremely powerful being in front of them. As the Lich kept talking, more undead creatures appeared behind them. It told Yuma, Ava, and the little ghost that it was there in the forest of the eastern mountains to seal it away. Suddenly, a huge magic seal appeared in the sky. It was as big as a black hole that looked like it could suck up all of what was present in the forest. As the seal appeared, a powerful gust of wind, almost similar to a tornado, formed around the giant zombie baby. Yuma tried his best to hold on to the ground as the wind was so powerful. The giant baby zombie was torn into pieces. Innocent children were trapped inside of its massive body. They formed a circle around the wind and went inside the lich's scepter. Yuma thought that it was somewhat nice, but at the same time, somewhat sad. According to him, it was a strange feeling. The Lich whispered to wish that the children inside his scepter, who had been trapped for so long, would hopefully find eternal rest with it. The Lich was about to leave, but Yuma stopped it. He had a request for the Lich. He mentioned the ghoul they captured a while back. He said it was a kid who became a ghoul due to the church. Yuma also stated that it did not have any master as of the moment and would rot away without one. He asked for the Lich's cooperation in overriding the control authority of the ghoul, but before he could finish, the Lich directed its scepter towards Yuma's neck. The Lich asked him if what he said was true. He wanted to make sure that Yuma wouldn't waste his time, otherwise there would be hell to pay if he was deceived. Yuma sweated in fear and shyly answered yes. The Lich was quick to agree and asked them to lead the way. Back at the church, one of the priests talked to someone assigned with a task. The person mentioned that things were proceeding smoothly. The priest told the assigned person to wait for a signal. After the assigned person confirmed that they understood the priest's words, the mayor of their town approached the priest with his daughter. He expressed his heartfelt gratitude to the priest for giving his daughter and the rest of the townspeople medicine. Such medicine guaranteed the full recovery of the affected people. Abruptly interrupting their wholesome conversation was a monster, who was killed by the powers of one of the chosen heroes. It was terminated with the use of sharp rock structures that pierced through its body. A guy who appeared to be holding a sword saved the priest and his company from any danger. He informed them to evacuate to the shelter to avoid further harm. A girl who accompanied the guy told him that she was done with the purification of the toxins. Another guy, wearing a necklace, who was also carrying a spear on his back, said that the monster was easy to defeat and that it didn't qualify as a warm-up. The priest praised the heroes of the church. He found it astounding as to how they have progressed given that they were able to quickly defeat the monsters that caused chaos around them. Facing the female hero, he bore some news for the rest of the team. He said that they found out where Yuma was being held. The female hero was shocked and asked if the priest was certain. 
The priest answered yes. He then told her that luckily, Yuma seemed unharmed. The priest added that according to their sources, Yuma was still under the control of a terrible vampire. The guy with the sword figured out that the vampire the priest was talking about was the same vampire who took Yuma that day. The priest informed them that the vampire also has the ability to brainwash others on top of having incredible fighting skills. He meant that rescuing Yuma may be difficult and that they should provide reinforcements. That served as his gentle reminder of how Ava was truly a powerful being who would not be easily messed with. Before the priest could finish what he was about to say, the guy with the spear interrupted him. He told them that they need no reinforcements. He was confident in their abilities as heroes who had quickly progressed over time. The vampire was his. He wanted to defeat the vampire by himself. He would make sure she would pay back for what she did. The guy with the spear led the team as he was highly determined to kill Ava. 